Grace, mercy, and peace are yours in abundance from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The word of God that serves as the basis for the sermon this morning comes to us from those familiar and comforting words from John 14, who just got done singing. In the name of Jesus, who brings comfort to hearts that are my friends. It was the night of Jesus' betrayal night on which he instituted that most precious of gifts, the sacrament of his body and blood. It was the night on which he made one precious promise after another about the gifts he would win for his disciples through his holy passion. He had told them often about the time of his suffering and the resurrection that would follow. And now Jesus stands at the door to death soon to appear before the gates of hell, harassed by his enemies, pounded by the devil, and loaded down under the weight of the sins of the world. His disciples were understandably anxious and troubled. Jesus had just told them earlier that he was going somewhere that they could not follow. In fact, in, shortly, in just a few hours, they would abandon him for, to be arrested and crucified. Jesus was going away. He was going to die. Here in John chapter 14, Jesus spends his time with his disciples, filling their hearts with reasons not to be troubled. He uses words that have calmed his disciples' hearts for centuries. And here today, these words help calm our hearts too. Jesus, that night, was trying to set his disciples' hearts at rest, and he told them to trust in God and in him regarding his departure. But his disciples' faith was clouded by doubt and false hope. Here, in the face of some of the most beautiful words in the entire Bible, some of the words that Jesus spoke that were the most comforting and reassuring. What did Jesus get as a response? Thomas spoke for the group. His response was, Huh? I just don't seem to get it. We don't know what you're talking about. That was the response. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Thomas could not conceive of a messianic kingdom that included departure or death. In Thomas's mind, he could not conceive that such suffering could be in the life of a Christian. Have you ever felt like Thomas? I've heard a hundred sermons or a thousand sermons. I've read some, much, most, all of the Bible, and still, huh? So often, I don't get it. Why does God allow such suffering? How can God allow me to suffer so often and so much? Why didn't He prevent this or that from happening? So often, I just don't know what's going on. I just don't know. He says He's going to prepare a place for me and that my heart shouldn't be troubled. But I am troubled afraid of what I see around me, and even what I see in me. I just don't understand. I don't understand half of my life. There are doctrines in the Bible that sometimes just don't make any sense to me. I repent of my sins, but my temptations don't go away. I'm so tired of how weak I am, how foolish. With Thomas, we cry out, Lord, I don't know where you're going. And I don't see how you're leading me to a better place. Then we have Philip, who like the rest of us, wanted to see the Father. Show us the glory cloud. Show us the sapphire pavement. Show us the fiery mountain. Show us the throne ringed by cherubim and seraphim. Legions of angels. Show us the Father. Some lifelong Christians think that these words Jesus spoke to his disciples, that these words are mainly for those 
unbelievers who think that there's more than one path to heaven, so we should save this for them. But finally, Jesus spoke these words to comfort his disciples because they were doubting their faith was weak. Consider Philip's question. Jesus had just told them, if you know me, then you know the Father. And then Philip said right back to him, show us the Father and that'll be enough. He looked right past Jesus. Jesus, you're not enough for us. Jesus is the way when it comes to the most important thing of all, the only thing that matters, life with God in heaven forever. But we as sinners on earth tend to think, yeah, but my focus needs to be on other things. And so we so often put our focus on things that aren't important at all. And then the devil leads us to think, well, if you really want these things, you're going to need to look past Jesus so that you can have more. You can take the words of Philip and you can say, Lord, take away the pain that I'm feeling right now. Then that'll be enough. Fix this relationship. That'll be enough for us. Just a little bit more money, a little more free time, a little more happiness in the moment. That'll be enough for us. Look at all of these things that are so unimportant that grasp and cling to only for them to fade away. These things do not satisfy, yet we chase after them. These things that do not last. Just like Philip, we look past Jesus' promises and we want more. Jesus' disciples knew the way. Jesus had been teaching them for the past three years. But the disciples were slow to catch on, just as we often are. Sinful man wants to look past this Galilean man, this man from Galilee 2,000 years ago. Sinful man simply does not understand the truth that is so crucial to the theology of the cross that the hidden God reveals Himself by hiding Himself. And so Jesus reveals to Thomas and Philip the only person who can reveal the hidden God Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There is only one way. And in that way is not a concept. It's a person. Jesus, take a closer look at this Jewish man from Galilee and see the hidden God. See the God of glory in the flesh, grace in the flesh, the God of glory willing to hide himself in human flesh and blood, to be born here in an animal feeding trough, to grow in wisdom and stature, to live in perfect obedience under the law that he established at creation, and to remain hidden unto death for us. Jesus said, if you really know me, you will know my Father as well. And from now on, you do know Him and have seen Him. To know the Son is to know the Father. With Jesus' suffering, death, and resurrection, the full picture comes into view. We don't, when we don't or won't understand, what should we do? When we are afraid by our own doubts and dullness, where should we turn when so many things just don't make sense? Where should we go for answers? When we just don't feel the love of our God, when we don't feel redeemed by His Son, what is the cure for our anguish? Jesus. Jesus alone. The Gospel heals us when Jesus redirects our troubled hearts back to Him. I am the way. Look at the path that I tread. 
It is the way of the cross. It is the path you too will tread. But when you don't understand its pain or its point or its purpose, look at me. It all ends in resurrection triumph, in eternal life and blessedness, in the Father's house. I am the truth. When you don't understand this or that part of my word and promise, look at me. I am the truth. Your feelings, your reason, your understanding, they're not the source of truth. I am the truth. Abandon all that you think and want and feel and look at me. I am the life. When life seems to have little points, when you are terrified by by death itself and its terrors frighten you. Look at me. Even then, look to me. I have come to bring you from death to life. Your death will follow mine into eternal life. And that means that even when you fail to understand, no one can snatch you from my hand. You remain under my watchful care and I have a place prepared for you there. And that's all that really matters. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe in the evidence of the works themselves. Jesus reaches our hearts with these words. But then he proves that everything he says, every word he says is true by his works, his actions. He tells us what heaven is like. He tells us he's going there to prepare a place for us. He tells us that the only way to get there is through him. And then, just hours after he spoke these words, he proved that what he said was true. Jesus willingly went to the cross to suffer and to die. He paid for all sin. And he rose from the dead. This is the Gospel. He has paved the path for the rest of us so that all who believe in him will follow the same path that he went on from earth to heaven, from death to life, from grief to joy. Is your heart ever full of doubt? Do you ever find yourself clinging to hopes that fail you? This is a message that you need. Jesus has covered all of your sins with his blood. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is caring for us right now. He is with us in our anguish. Everything in this world fades away. And it changes all the time. But God's promises will always stand firm because they are anchored in our Savior Jesus. Here is comfort for hearts that are troubled. Listen again to the words of Jesus. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may be where I am. In Christ, you have everything that really matters. In Christ alone is your hope of forgiveness of sins, new life, and salvation. Christ is all you need. Amen. The peace of God that transcends all human understanding will guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.